So Shane, um, you've done a lot of things. You've been an entrepreneur, a uh, digital CEO, a CMO. You've done it in full-time and in fractional capacities. Can you maybe just give just a, a quick kind of 60 second on, on who you are? Obviously, I've had the pleasure of working with you, but a lot of the folks now or in the future that I'll be listening to this, I just want them to understand that just the true gravity of the work you've done. Sure. So thank you, Pete, and the team at uh, Digital Surgeons. Great to be on 404. Um, always have fun talking with Pete, so uh, hopefully you guys, we don't talk too fast, go too long. So my background is, you know, I moved from Dublin 25 years ago, um, arrived in the U.S. and started on digital. Um, first websites were default gray backgrounds, uh, worked with a couple of great Russian programmers, and got a real deep dive in technology. Uh, and we didn't know at the time that we were going to be delivering, you know, complex websites or anything like that. Um, so I've been involved for 25 years in basically, I would call it digital transformation. And we're still doing it. Uh, I jokingly joke with a friend of mine, we have a presentation from our agency.com days about 22 years ago. We could actually, it's about the multi-channel world. We could take the logo out and give that pitch today and it still would resonate and feel new to many folks. So that's, I suppose, scary, but it's good in one sense. Um, my background has been on the agency side and then I moved to uh, the software side, I suppose the first SaaS vendors, I'll literally recall ASP at the background. And I have generally run marketing, also about 80% of the time have been responsible for products. And a number of times I have run all the business development aspects, particularly indirect partnerships. And twice was asked to sit in the CTO seat, actually in the middle of uh, two acquisitions to manage um, just what was going on. Um, more or less, I suppose, for the last 15 years, if I looked at what I've been doing, it's more of a quasi COO CEO because I am driving a lot of alignment that is customer facing across the typical marketing product uh, sales team. And I would add service because I think that's a weakness in a lot of vendors is, you know, get your customer up and running, make them successful. Um, and that has evolved to working in age startups for who are extremely successful at exits, two that ran out of money, and two that you know, ended up going back more as bootstrap scenarios. And then I've worked in about 10 fractional roles. They would typically be long-term, usually coming in, attacking something that's marketing facing, usually then working across the whole business. Um, I would say that what I drive is a customer-centric lens in the organization. So really be able to drive a non-cognitive bias on you know, what is the customer, who are they? How do we satisfy it? Uh, yeah, and I love that, Shane. That's that, you know, sort of for the for the uh, the folks that are tuning in now. I mean, basically, what what that means to me, having had the pleasure of working with you on a number of different things, is that you're a bullshit-free leader, right? So one of the things you talk a lot about is sort of, you know, I think what brought a lot of folks that are that are online here now is, you know, what's all this digital candy that people are selling in their C-suite? So you know, use that term digital candy a lot. Um, Talk to us about what is digital candy and what is digital transformation and, and how are they different in your opinion? Sure. So it's interesting. Digital candy to me, a lot of times looks like repackaged IT projects, whether it's directly in the IT group or whether it's driven by, you know, somebody in the C-suite, chief revenue officer, marketing, service, or whatever. Uh, and all they've really done is taken those projects and repurposed them. Uh, while they may have business drivers or external focusing, a lot of them seems to focus on doing things faster, bigger, better, but from the internal perspective. So, you know, like any C-suite, we look at growth, productivity, and cost. And realistically, most of them really seem to hammer on cost and productivity. So in my mind, they're trying to optimize the business model they have. Whereas transformation, I actually take the digital out because it's just a bit of a misnomer. Transformation to me is about looking at your market, your business, and figuring out new ways to grow it, whether that's new markets, new products, new ways of what you're doing to your existing client base, understanding your customers, um, and then stepping in and looking at, okay, what is it we want to achieve? And then the digital and the tech and the process all comes after that. So, you know, some of the, even one of the successes I touch on today isn't really about digital transformation, it's about market transformation. So to me, that's what it is. Um, transformation generally is painful, um, very painful. I, 
you know, anecdotally, I would say 80% of people don't like change, you know, so that tells you where you are. And then within that 80%, there's often a third who will fight it in every way possible. And there's always a group that want to wait and see and jump on the wagon, and that's great. But, you knew, you know, you're looking for your 10, 20% champions to drive it. Um, I love that. I love yeah. that, Shane. I think, you know, it's, it's funny. You now you, you and I have talked about digital candy quite a bit. And, you know, what I mean by that for the group here is when I think about digital candy, you know, the, the one thing that every CEO or CMO that brings us in or that, that when you hear about these digital transformation case studies that you read about in, you know, on Google or Harvard Business Review or wherever you get your news from, that's uh, hopefully legitimate these days. <laughs> Don't get me started on that tangent. Um, but in all seriousness, it's like going out and eating a candy bar, right? You eat a candy bar, you know, you feel good for like a couple minutes. You get that kind of sugar rush. You're going, you're moving fast and then you crash right? After it sort of quickly wears off. So I think, you know, what Shane's talking about here is this idea that how do we create sustained transformation and really achieve agility? So in your, in your position, Shane, you've seen it from the tech lens, the business lens, where do you feel like agility or agile in the, in the sort of methodology wins? Where does it, where does it fail? Where does it work together? Just, you have a very specific thought on agile that I would just love for you to take the group through and, and just some of your, your war stories and your win stories there. Sure. So having ran product in R&D um, when it was really waterfall, which is, you know, long term projects, nine, 12 months, don't see anything, you know, dangerous in a startup and particularly because the market may be gone <laughs> or not there, you know, but even more dangerous, I think, in big companies. I think I saw a stock a couple of years ago, Wall Street projects in the noughties and 90s, 80 percent of the time never fulfilled the project deadlines, expectations, wow. goals, you know. So to me, Agile is a mindset, but if you look at the true definition of Wikipedia, it's based on customer successes. So a lot of what we see in Agile is take your waterfall, make it sprints, and still deliver it. But to me, in Agile, when you set, you know, they use the concept stories or prios, when you set them, whether they're on a big level or a small level, you're setting them as outcomes you want to change, see, improve. And I'll give a very anecdotal uh, example. When I started to use it with marketing, maybe 2010 in particular, um, you know, people come to you, oh yeah, we need to do a sales deck. And the ROI will be, the sales deck was delivered to sales. I'm like, no, no, no. The ROI is, has it helped increase the sales cycle? Did it get first meeting to second meeting? Do the sales team use it in certain kinds of meetings? What content resonates? So that's a very different, it's an outcome driven approach. So the fundamental, I, I like to see that. The other part is it's no one system. So we all go through all the hype cycles and everything. It's usually a hybrid model. Um, so for me, you know, having run IT organization, a very large data center for electronic discovery, highly secure environment, you know, we ran the infrastructure waterfall line. You know, big, big projects, virtualized and storage, virtualized DSDs These are six, 12 month projects. Obviously we had checkpoints along the way for seeing right. the target success, but the development team who are building the day-to-day -day stuff to analyze that data, legal data, we ran that totally agile. We ran it in two week sprints, you know, usually no more than three of those together. It was addressing, you know, needs and features that we saw coming down the line. On top of that, we had actually had a daily Agile team who are fixing quick hit needs. So in discovery, we find that, hey, a search terms that we're using, we need to change the algorithm, we need to customize it. So, you know, it's not a one fit all, but I do like the mindset. But I, I will say, if you're not looking at outcomes that open, you're impacting the front of the organization, the customer facing stuff, I think you need to check what you're really doing there. You're just doing fast project management. Yeah, no, I love that. It's fast project management. And I think, you know, everyone wants to move faster. And I think sometimes people in, in pursuit of trying to move fast, um, the pursuit of efficiency, they end up becoming, you know, ineffective. So what I always say to, to my teams and my customers is, you know, let's balance the scales of effectiveness and efficiency and try to get to some place where, you know, in some cases to be really effective, you have to be really inefficient, right? You know, the, the old Paul Graham startup quote, uh, do things that don't scale, he said, right? So I'm a huge fan of that. Let's talk about ROI for a second, Shane. So, you know, obviously the role I'm seeing in the C-suite right now, I, a couple of years ago, I could tell the difference between the CMO, the CIO, or the CIO, just simply based on how they were approaching conversations. I'd love for you to tell the audience a bit more about what are some of those nuances in terms of what you're seeing 
uh, the, the role of the CMO and the role of the CEO start to converge into that more digital centric or customer centric perspective. I just want to get your perspective because there's a lot of groups, you know, large, large and global in many cases that bring you in and, you know, what's, what are you seeing? You don't have to name names because we don't want to, we don't want to shame anybody here on 444, right? But we do want to understand that shifting role. Cause I see some folks here in the audience now that, you know, are in leadership roles and, and they're probably asking themselves the question as to, how do I make sure that I'm not delivering digital candy in my C-suite? How do I make sure that I'm actually delivering transformation? So I think this is on every level. This is particularly for marketing folks, but all teams. So, you know, the CEO metrics are, you know, revenue, margin, cash, pretty much, you know? So it, or I should say it's the CFO metric, right? So, you know, the other C-suite people need to understand how do they fit into that? So one of the things that I adopted very quickly from a um, little bit of interaction with uh, David Scott at Matrix was SaaS metrics. And it works in a non-SaaS world and it works in a physical product world. And what I really and like- Shane talked about here just for the group, um, software as a service, just I, I got that question privately, what is SaaS? Just software as a service, it's a business model. Sorry, Shane, just helping, helping them out with the buzzwords here. Yes. Uh, and actually this sometimes tells me too what needs to go on the seat. So, so LTV is lifetime value. In the SaaS world, it's typically measured in revenue. So it's this customer over a lifetime of two, four, 10 years will deliver hopefully this amount of revenue, okay? I also look at it as a customer lens. So you can call it customer loyalty, customer experience, customer satisfaction, uh, and I measure both. So in an ideal world, you're driving financial results, but you're also driving satisfied customers. That's not to say, you know, there's difficulty with customers, but at the end of the day, they like what you're doing for them. You're adding value uh, on it. So that's important. So when you look at then a lot of our, the benchmarks around SaaS, you can actually take those metrics and start to drive them down into individual groups. And a real simple one in the CMO world was MQL. Yep. Before that, we, you know, we had budget, we spent it, we're not sure what was working, famous Ogilvy quote, you know, and there's still a lot of that, but MQL, at least on the demand generation side, which I think is critical, I think it's part of branding and everything else, because at the end of the day, we need to drive engagement. I want to touch on that for one second, Shane, for the group member, back to Digital Candy. So for, for those of you tuning in, so the question I want you to all ask yourself is, am I driving marketing qualified leads, MQLs, or am I driving sales qualified leads? And really... How do you determine the differences between a marketing qualified lead or a sales qualified lead, especially in organizations that you know have a mix of sales leadership and marketing leadership? It's often a tug of war. What we've seen in certain models, uh, usually one wins over the other. Um, but I definitely would would love to make sure that you're unpacking that chain, just because MQL. I'm, get, I'm getting lots of great questions uh, here privately. I want to make sure I'm addressing everybody and, and not calling anyone out because this is four and four is about discovery and curiosity, right? So you need to do, you need to set a baseline on what an MQL is, you know, whatever way you evolve that through scoring, agreement, you sit with a head of sales, sales organized and agree that. But in reality, you're constantly, what you should be focused on is improving the quality of the MQL. So what I tend to look for and I like to see is, okay, it becomes a sales qualified lead. I'd like what's called the concept, which is sales verified leads, or there's other terms for that. And I'm particularly interested in the MQLs coming from the marketing organization, but also from other areas. And what percentage of those then are become sales verified leads? And then, you know, using both data and actual constant conversation with the sales organization and with prospects and clients to understand why they're better qualified. And that should be constantly feeding back up into the marketing funnel around messaging, all those different stuff as well. So, you know, it's a constant iteration. You got to start one place. At the end of the day though, you're, you're hopefully delivering sales verified leads that turn into opportunities that close that are revenue. So you track it to revenue. For sure. Right. So just again, for the group here, right? So we can't talk about ROI or return on investment in your C-suite if you haven't quantified what the investment is and what the return of it is going to be. So, you know, again, understanding, are we trying to ge generate just volume of leads? Are they qualified leads? Or are we talking about, you know, things closing? The question I was actually at a meeting yesterday, Shane, with a CEO, and I asked the question, I said, would you rather a hundred leads tomorrow or would you rather two leads next month that close and actually turn into business? Um, and, you know, the, I'm not going to say the name, but the person was like, 
never really thought of that. I just thought we wanted leads. So I think what we spend a lot of time now is just identifying who is that customer, you know, who's just going to be spamming that contact form on your site and just filling up your HubSpot and your, and your Pardot uh, forms on your site versus actually converting. So I, I love that we're digging into ROI. I know you, you like me, Shane, you hate wasting time. You know, you talk a lot about uh, having quality first meetings. So I'd love for just you to unpack that for us. What's a quality first meeting and, and how do you make sure that you're happening? I mean, I, I'm just going to ask the group here to put a show of hands. How many meetings has the group here been in? Just raise your hand here in the, in the, the Zoom webinar. Uh, if you've been on a meeting in the past couple of days that you felt was like just a complete waste of time. Wow. I, I don't think there was a single hand in the room that's not up right now. So um, I, I, I'm, I'd ask them to raise their hands if they want to have more qualified, <laughs> more quality meetings. But Shane, let's just start first to find that for us. Sure. How do you make sure you're having quality first meetings in a world where now the de facto solution is let's have a meeting about it? Yeah. So obviously we're talking about a buyers, you know, um, I've learned this from working with three or four particularly successful heads of sales who on all intents and purposes, I think in all cases became CEOs, which was interesting. Oh. Um, to me, a first quality meeting is the key stakeholders from probably the economic decision-making side, as well as the subject matter champion is in that meeting. There may be other influencers. Sometimes, lucky enough, the subject matter champion may also be the economic decision-maker, right? And what you're doing is you're going into that meeting and they have some understanding of what you will add value to and that you understand their problem or their challenge or their opportunity. And they've got true soft touch marketing and maybe even some business development outreach and understanding that this is a good fit. And to me then, actually what is important is the next step out of the first quality meeting. So, you know, I've been involved in, I actually generally help put together that presentation that's used for first meeting. I have a golden rule. Can you do it in six slides, 10 max? Now the appendix may be 200, to be honest. <laughs> um, but if we're successful, we shouldn't get past slide two or three. So if, because we all use PowerPoints, uh, we can use whiteboards and whatever. What you're doing is you're hopefully starting to establish a track for the business case, which is key to the economics decision maker. And let's say for the diligence, which is key to the champion, because they need to check whether you're a product or service offering, you do all that. And I always say success here is a number of weeks later, those two people meet around the coffee and say, the stuff I'm getting from that team at Digital Surgeons is so good. Like, yeah, funny enough, what they walked just through in the diligence. Okay, it's time for us to move to the next step. Yeah. So Love that. that. Yeah. No, I love that. And, you know, Shane, one of the things that a lot of groups here, I know um, with COVID and everything, companies have really been forced to transform overnight in some cases with how they communicate, how they collaborate, you know, where we're having a lot of success. And, I, and just um, for anyone that's tuning in now is definitely look at what meetings have to be synchronous or actually happen in real time or could be asynchronous, right? So um, where we've had a lot of success recently is, you know, identifying what are the things that we need to discuss, what are the things that we need to decide and then sending out in advance um, I think in some cases, just with everybody being remote now because of COVID, um, for, for many of us, um, that, that FaceTime, that human connection is something that's missing. So, you know, how do you think we can start to encourage um, quality first meetings, but at the same time being mindful of the differences in the people in the room, right? So we see obviously now um, some folks are more, uh, more extroverted or introverted, depending on where they fall on that spectrum. Um, so how do we make sure, Shane, that we're having quality first meetings, but we're honoring all the different types of stakeholders? You know, one of the things I love, Shane, about digital transformation is finally designers and engineers, folks like that have a seat at the table um, where they often weren't previously doing that, right? A lot of times it was, you know, a closed board or a closed, a closed board room and, and the folks who were actually affecting and acting the change with the customer, they weren't there. So back to the question, really, how do you think we can sort of honor all the different types of uh, folks and backgrounds and personalities, but still have a quality first meeting. So sure. So, you know, when I'm asked to sit in the meeting, um, as say a C-suite executive to obviously lend something to the meeting or move something along because it's required, I actually want to know profile in everybody. Um, in many ways, I like to know what the organization challenges are, but also any personal stuff. Um, I like to know behavioral stuff. So, you know, not to pick on, engineers, but some of the best engineers I know are very introverted having worked with them, you know? So I'm like, okay, so, you know, if I need to get a message across to them, I'm not looking for immediate reaction. 
far from it. Um, and that may be something that's followed up, whether it's me or somebody else as an individual. So it's actually understanding the personalities in the room and understanding cues, which are, you know, in some ways easier and harder because they're on the screen now, actually, and you see them all. Um, but understanding that and understanding that, you know, the goal is one or two things. That's all. So, you know, don't, you're not trying to close the deal. Uh, you're not trying to answer and address every single question. You're trying to move it to a next stage. And I've learned this from really good salespeople and great CEOs who are really the front of company that are able to do this. So I think that's critical. And so it's, you know, it's, it's what in, we now see BDRs do, you know, build out a profile company. It's a, you know, I hate using the hype terms, but it's fundamental part of account-based marketing and sales. No, no question, Shane. So I think one thing I want to give to the audience, since 444 is always about great resources, I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Love this book, Thinking Fast and Slow. What we heard Shane say essentially here is the way that we can honor everyone that's in that room is understand that not all folks are able to respond right away, right? So I love this, this book by, um, you know, Nobel, Nobel Prize winner in economics talking about the difference between thinking fast and slow. So if you haven't checked that out, um, definitely want to, want to recommend that, that book to you. It got me thinking a lot about how the brain and different personalities and behaviors uh, tune into things. So um, we'll, we'll include a link to that afterwards. But no, this is great, Shane. So, so just sort of one of the, the questions that actually came up for someone that's going through a digital transformation is, you know, one of the big, big things that's happened is the event space. The event world has really changed because of uh, COVID and everything. So the question we heard here from Eric was, are virtual events becoming victims of digital candy? as the highest attendance seems to be the goal versus having real quality connections and progress. I'd love to get your thoughts on that, Shane. Yeah. Um, so I have a love-hate relationship with events over the years because of the amount of budgets I inherited are spent on it. So uh, something I did very on was start to understand what was happening in events. And what I've seen in most industries, not all, is actually don't generate brand new leads. But what you do do is you potentially accelerate deals in the pipeline, the opportunity. So I actually measure events in both areas. And when I do that, we're better able to understand what events work for us. And what has happened over time is the more specialized the events are, the more focused they are, the more to have, I hate the term, taught leadership tracks in them, the more likely they're going to be successful for a lot of companies. So I think similarly in the virtual world, um, you know, I worked with a company recently we had to teach people about the new billing codes for telehealth. That was about volume. It literally was one-on-one because most people didn't even know what it was about, right? Sure. The next level though was the people who were going to implement it, understand it, help build the business cases. What we were looking for there was people that were in the business case evaluation building phase. So it wasn't about volume, it was about, okay, we have these 50 prospects in the pipeline, let's make sure we get them on. You know, we ended up doing a recording to share the info and stuff like that. So I think you need, again, understand the audience. So is the goal to your previous question, 100 names that might at some stage become something in the pipeline? Or is it five people that we know are in an active buying process and we need to help them in whatever way? Amen. No, I love that. That's, that, that's great. And I, again, just for the audience here, please feel free to, to drop some questions in the Q&A tab below on the Zoom. We're going to be jumping into as many as we can get to. It's, it's all about conversation and back and forth and, and really excited for that. You know, Shane, one of the things that, that gets confused a lot, and you've seen this both on B2B and B2C, um, is just the role that brand plays from a design and digital transformation perspective. You know, the question I'd love for you to help us understand is just what are some brands, it doesn't have to be brands that you've worked with directly, I mean, it could be any that just really show up for you. What are some good cases that you think are not well trafficked when it comes to brand and, and digital transformation? I mean, obviously we've all heard about the, the Uber and Netflix stories and, and all that, those trite examples, but just Shane, from your perspective on the front lines, what are some of those real brands that are transforming and that really get it, that, that you can point to that inspire you and can inspire this audience? Sure. So I want to qualify two things and um, something that I, uh... A very well-respected VC, highly successful, said to me many years ago, forget about a building a brand in a company under 100 million in revenue. I wouldn't say that's quite right. He says, your job is to build customers, and over time, the brand will evolve. The other part is, I actually look at a customer experience as three things. Your engagement on content and brand is, you know, particularly brand identity is content. Uh, your engagement with the product and services 
and your engagement with the people. So a lot of the brand work I've been involved in has mostly been focused the internal stuff, the culture, the value and all that. So, you know, it's easier to build successful new brands, the ones you just mentioned. It's harder to transform one. The one that I love is Chobani, um, Fabus story. Uh, and it's not actually digital transformation at all. It's market transformation. Um, so a little bit of background. Peter McGuinness is, was hired as chief marketing officer maybe six, seven years ago. Came from DDDB in Chicago. Really good guy. Um, came in there. The yogurt market was a slowing market. Actually, I think we're starting to retract 1% a year. Chobani, though, were growing at 2%. So they were outperforming in the market by a long shot. Um, and the first three years, he was doing a good job. You know, they were, they were moving it along. It was good. But it's like, it's not big. I'm not moving the needle. You know, he himself, I'm not doing it. And he stepped back and he took a look at it. And he actually took a look at the customer. So I know we may just touch on customer journey, but he looked at the big picture and the market. And he looked at it. And he looked at stuff that was weird in yogurt and stuff like, all oh, yogurt looks perfect. But actually, it's not like that in the factory. You know, all these weird little stuff and kind of just builds, I suppose, a, a data profile of sorts, a load of data, all unstructured, not necessarily qualitative. And he said, you know what? We need to understand our purpose because they're a pretty purpose-driven organization, if anybody oh, yeah. an immigrant, whatever. And he's like, at the, at the underneath it all, we're just a good humanity-based company. So he says, you know what? Let's look at this again and say, okay, so if that's what we do, we care about our products. So let's shift from being a yogurt company to being a wellness nutrition company. All of a sudden he created a new category. And then internally he understood that, you know, and this is I think a weakness in all transformations, digital is loads of things go on. He says, we need to get everybody behind one story. And he created the demand team, which was marketing, product innovation, not all the product, product innovation, sales, merchandising, all those things, finance operation, by the way. And they drove this whole thing around demand internally organization and there's a whole purpose behind it and whatever. And then they went out externally as a brand and talked about wellness, nutrition and whatever like that. And it, you know, he grew them business and the business I think grew 15% or 12% last year, right? Huge, right? Yeah. He's now, he was no longer the chief commercial officer. He's now president. So he looks after the supply chain as well, but small things that they did. And he made, by the way, he, making loads of mistakes. Small things they did, like he said, do you know that white yogurt has loads of little things in it? So it actually showed yogurt. They actually produced a line of yogurt with the little black things in it because that's what yogurt looks like naturally. Packaging, easier to open for kids, all these little things. So because he was so customer focused and he got the organization behind that, everybody started to look at everything they're doing this is why I love customer journey. It's like, okay, what is it that we're doing at every touch point that we can improve? And, you know, what are we doing to help our retailers? Do we have, do we have a customer data system that actually allows us to see things, to give advice to a retailer on how to burn a merchandise? Or if it's an e-tailer, where should we turn the budget to help that e-tailer and whatever? And, and I just, I think it's a fabulous success story. It's not about digital transformation. Now, did they do a load of digital stuff in the background? Absolutely. But it was after the fact, you know? You know, it's funny you said that, Shane, because I, I think that is probably one of the best examples of digital transformation. You know, I, I say this as an engineer, someone who started writing code when, you know, when I was, you know, before 13, I was writing code and, and making software. You know, what I tell people all the time is when you're trying to transform something, you have to understand the space that you occupy in people's minds, hearts, and wallets, right? So the only way to do that is through customer journey, which we're going to get into, because I know, I know the folks are really excited for us to dive into some of, of your tricks. But... I believe wholeheartedly, you know, our whole position at DS is we design demand, right? So this idea is how do you design demand? You have to have people power transformation. So I think the one thing that organizations I see forgetting about, which is where that digital candy comes in, is they want to buy a technology or buy a cloud platform and, and check the box. Oh, we've transformed ourselves. We've transformed ourselves. So would you say that's something you've come across a couple times in the C-suite? Yeah. I just Googled this morning for fun. I know what was going to happen. I Googled uh, digital transformation success stories. The first three of five links were references and every single one of them were talking about migration to the cloud, this, that, and the other. And two of them mentioned SAP, actually SAP, mentioned the cultural pieces. I'm just like, that's not, that's digital candy. It's not. To, now I understand where it comes from and vendors and IT. 
But yeah, um, it's people. I mean, I say to people, forget the digital, forget the tech. Let's start with people. Forget even process. You know, my focus is customers, but I've been in organizations where they looked at the internal employees or the supply chain, you know, the suppliers. Pick that. Do your map. Understand it. Now start to say, okay, what is the opportunity? What can we improve today? What could be net new in the future? All those areas. You know, and understand that and let that drive whatever model you use for strategic, if it's critical success factors or whatever. And, and also let it drive across the silos. And I learned this using the journey maps that every team was doing something to improve customer satisfaction. So then every month each team would roll out a customer success satisfaction project. Like, whoa, stop. It's one critical success factor for the year. By the way, if two you're rolling out this quarter, you need to bring your story together and share it with all the employees. And by the way, marketing and sales, if this is something you have to externalize, let's do it once, you know? So tell me something, Shane. So, you know, obviously you and I, we've, we've gotten our hands dirty uh, in a lot of different areas and you feel really strongly that even as a leader, the need to still get your hands dirty is, is a pretty important thing. So I do want to pause on that in just a second and dig deeper as to what do you mean by the importance of getting your fingers dirty in, in certain things. I, I want you to dig into that for some emerging leaders that are on this call and now in the future. But the thing I want to talk about is just customer journey in general, right? So I hear that term a lot. You and I obviously have a lot of frontline experience in it. But the question I have for you is if you were walking into a small startup, maybe they just got some VC funding, or you were walking into a global 100-year-old organization, one question for you would be, What's something you can, how can you explain customer journey in a way that both those size organizations and life stage organizations understand? And then give the audience some specifics as to where they can start if, if journey mapping is not something that they have a lot of expertise in. Because I think when you take it to a more human level, it's actually pretty easy to do it, right? So I keep it high level, it's seven boxes, to be honest, six, whatever. You know. um, I tend to look at a full cycle. So I'll ask the CEO, the large organization, or the founders are small, okay, let's map out from anonymous, they don't know anything about you, uh, to end of year two revenue. In a bigger company, it could be end of year five revenue. Okay, what are the critical things along there from your internal perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And what I do is when they're talking to me about, oh, sales, and distribution, and on ramping, and upselling, and cross-selling, I start to put the customer lenses on it. Okay, I'm sitting in the customer. So we're, we're mapping it together. And there's usually a disjoint, which is kind of interesting. There's also classic places, you know, so with a startup, you know, it's okay, how good are you at new customer development? And then you get to the phase of, okay, can you scale that? But then what's critical, particularly in key SaaS businesses and many others is, okay, at what point do you start to drive 70% of your revenue from the existing customer base? And I can always log in. Tell me how you unramp a client. What does it look like? What success look like? It's always internal facing things. They got trained. They did this, whatever, you know. And I, I've got a real good anecdotal story in this one. I worked with a company recently um, who were um, working with manufacturing companies. And the goal was a 60-day goal. The KPI was to get people trained. And then they would go out and site and they would load all their devices on the manufacturing floor. And I said, let's switch the goal to you go on site and you watch all the people you train load devices. And they, I said, I bet you that will pull your monthly recurring revenue closer to you because now they're up and running day one. Oh, by the way, CMO, you need that success story three months afterwards. It will be there. So, you know, turn it into champions. Bigger companies, it's just the fragmentation, the fact that they're doing multiple stuff. So I try to keep it high level. I do use the concept of on stage and off stage. On stage is all the things a customer visibly sees, um, whether that's content, whether it's people. And um, classic one is how do you, you know, you're a customer satisfaction organization, you want about your loyalty. What happens when, you know, a person's late by a couple of days for your payments? For an invoice, how do you treat it? Or we send a legal letter. I'm like, whoa, okay. Is that what all those people put out hard work in? I don't want to pick in finance, but that's just an easy example. So there's places, so you, you know, you unwrap. I've done my research, obviously, on the organization uh, to our previous discussion, and you unwrap it. And really, what I want the map is just a high level framework for them to start to look at where can we improve stuff. 
based on what the people are doing. Offstage is all the stuff that happens to make those onstage points successful. So 25 developers working morning, noon, and night to get high quality code out so you can get to market faster. You know, so they understand where they're going. And then I kind of mapped the silos. And what I start to do is like, well, actually, I marketing, but actually it's marketing and sales. And you're like, well, it's, yes, it is. I know it's marketing during that initial time. So start to pull the people together, you know, on it. So start to make it people driven, high level. And, you know, what you're really talking about is, you know, awareness, you know, interest, moving into decision making, yeah. um, up and running, what it takes to get them going, uh, and then making them successful, which also people call customer advocacy and stuff like yeah. that. By the no, way, sure. they all layer over each other a little, or whatever. Um, Absolutely. And it, well, one of the things, Jim, I'm just going to jump in for one second here, just because um, I've I've been in, in those journey mapping meetings with you, and they're just a hell of a lot of fun. So just for the group here, it wouldn't be me, and it wouldn't be four 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 if I didn't drop this. So the easiest way to do a journey map, obviously, you can use tools like Miro now, which Alyssa will put in the chat room here uh, to do this virtually. But you know, face to face, all you really need is post-it notes, the whiteboard and a collective audience. You know, what I always say to people is, um, uh, I was in a room recently with a C-suite and I asked them when the last time they visited their customer journey map was, and they were like, what's a customer journey map? And this is a very successful company. And, and one of the things that I said is, um, have you ever seen um, the Pirates of the Caribbean? And they looked at me like I was crazy. Um, and I said, yeah, I'm gonna teach you the easiest way to do a customer journey map. And I'm gonna start by teaching you how pirates sound. And I was like, "R." And like, they kind of looked at me like I was crazy because. That's, you were in that, you know how I get, Shane, and when I get fired up in these meetings. So for everybody that's on this, if you're not familiar with journey maps, it's okay. Um, whether you're a startup or a Fortune 50, you can all understand pirate metrics. So Google it, we'll put a link there. Um, it's really simple. It's like R, like it sounds like, like a bad pirate term. So acquisition, activation, retention, referral, revenue. There's a lot more fancier frameworks out there. I mean, they kind of look more like a hair dryer and a game of shoots and ladders if it's a damn good journey map. And there's all kinds of software and cloud stuff to do that. So I'm not going to get into the weeds on that today. But what I want this group to understand is what are all the steps, as Shane said, on stage, off stage? What are all the human actions that go through from the time that someone understands or gets sees your Instagram ad or your white paper or your virtual conference? What are all the steps that have to happen in that journey? And going through it as a human or going through it, one of the things we've done too is pretend you're the product. We were working with a cell phone remanufacturing company and I basically said, imagine yourself being the cell phone, going through all the journeys and all the different steps. So I know, uh, Shane, I saw a couple of folks messaging me privately going, well, I don't know what a journey map is. That's okay. So maybe we can do a breakout workshop where Shane can teach us how to do that. But yeah, no, this is, um, this is an interesting thought. We got a good question from the audience, Shane, that I think ties into journey map. So Shane, what are your thoughts on, on rebrands in terms of just transformation, both successful and, and not successful? What do you feel is the true main intent behind a rebrand? Is it to draw attention, fix something wrong with the brand, or maybe is it just to make the brand scalable to reach new audiences? Are there any that come to mind? That was a question from Joey here in the audience. Yeah, so I, I get involved, I call them brand reduxes when I go into company. Um, so part of what I am trying to do is make the marketing message more in the, you know, the sales marketing message, even the product, be more customer friendly, be in the customer lingo and stuff like that. But I normally find what I have to do is we have to attack the culture, who we are. And then people try out values and all that. So I use a five spoke wheel methods just because it's easy. Um, and, you know, each time it's different. Um, the reason I'm doing that is first understand who we are and what our mission is, all those kind of things. And to make sure that, honestly, the CEO and C-suite live it, because they have to own that. They own the culture. They own the org. I mean, realistically, you know, at the C-suite, our job is to empower the people that work for us so that we can deliver great product services and wow moments for the customer. So, you know, sometimes the rebrand's not an external thing. It's just recognition of what we are as a culture. And I know culture's overused, um, but it is, you know, and, and what I'm is like, culture? what is culture? Unpack that for us here, Shane. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Um, it's how we behave first and foremost, the good behaviors and the negative behaviors and how we support the good behaviors and how we stop the negative behaviors. Um, 
you know, in a very fundamental way, are we empathetic to each other? You know, um, are we top down, up bottom? You know, do we facilitate? You know, I'm like you, I'm quite powerful in the room, so I've had to learn to keep quiet because it's not about my idea, it's about the other ideas, and maybe they won't tell me in a room. So, you know, how do you facilitate all that stuff, you know? Um, and having coached rugby teams, I don't play anymore. So how do I get 15 players to play together? Because on a rugby field, no one guy or girl can actually win the game. You actually have decision makers, multiple decision makers. So I learned a lot from, from, from the sports side and whatever. So um, it's creating that. And, and usually it ends up as a statement. And, you know, Zappos is a great one. You know, we want to provide a culture where employees want to come to work every day, where they will feel satisfied in the jobs they're doing and how that will impact customers. I'm not sure if that's exactly their term, but something like that. Yeah. Sure. That's on the wall. And, you know, so if I do something or I set a behavior as a CEO or CMO, I had a product, you know, people can call me out on it in a nice way, empathetic way. Similarly, if I see bad behaviors, you know, in my own experience with startups is, you know, you get that. If you set some bad behaviors early on because of the need to do stuff fast, you know, balancing the slow, fast thing, that permeates and I, I think I saw from Google they said you know after nine months we couldn't change the culture now funny enough I think they did in the mid noughties I think they did actually a really good job or certainly to change the perception so I think that's a core piece of branding the external piece is you know like we said with Chobani you know you, you're, no, you're no longer selling yogurt you're selling wellness products of which yogurt part of whatever and you need to get that out to the message and you're saying to the internal employees and staff and executives, now this is what it translates into the markers. So yes, did Chobani rebrand? I'm not so sure. Did they? No, I, so interesting, Shane. And, and Joey, thank you, thank you so much for such a great question to get our, to get our brains going. You know, Joey, how I'd answer your question um, would be a little bit different than, than Shane here, which would be, for me, as humans, as we grow and evolve, our belief systems change. Right. You know, I think in many cases, the best thing that great executives can do is they can unlearn some of the things that they have learned. You know, I know I myself made so many mistakes. I, I make mistakes every single day with with how I'm leading and running my customers, my clients, my companies. And, you know, one of the things I think is interesting with a rebrand is it allows you to say to the world that we've changed. Our belief systems have changed and things need to evolve with it. You know, our values might need to change. Our, our, maybe we've achieved our mission. It's time to set a new mission. Maybe our vision's changed because the world's changed. Um, you know, if we want to be the, the leader in live events and COVID happens, well, maybe it's time for us to, 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 to reposition that particular thing. So I, I think that um, rebrands are a really great opportunity to signal to your, your teams, your customers, and your future prospects that um, where you're going, your belief systems have changed, and now you're, you're acting as if. I think that um, for me, a rebrand is so much more than just messaging stories or aesthetics. Um, for me, a rebrand is your opportunity to upgrade, like software, upgrade every aspect of your business, your leaders, um, your, your brand promise, you know, the things that you offer to people and that sort of thing. So that's what shows up for me. And, you know, I know Shane's a huge proponent of that. And again, like he was saying, it's about digging into those different steps and understanding the big picture, you know, much like a, the coach of a sports team. And Speaking of that, I'm not going to let you get off the hook here, Shane, without talking about getting your hands dirty and, and about that Irish saying of getting hit by a bus. So why don't you take us through those things? Because you know I'm not letting you off the hook. Sure. So um, I do believe that in certain areas of the business, the C-suite should be doing some hands-on stuff. So my very first company, agency.com, we my mentor was Exxon Microsystems, probably one of the great customer-friendly organizations ever, partner-friendly. And um uh, he instituted an executive steward council. You know, we were 200 million a year, one of the high flyers at the time. Every executive needed to have two clients that they had lunch with twice a year. Everybody. Funny enough, do you know who the most successful guy was? The CFO. It was fascinating, you know? So, you know, that's a good example, very high level, you know? Um, for me, it's like, I like to do a lot of the building and let my teams run all the time. So, you know, if we need to deploy a customer data platform because I can get techy like yourself, you know, let me look into that. Let me look into those parts. Let me understand, you know, I don't run Twitter anymore, but I certainly would run Instagram and a lot of companies I want to be in there because that's where I learn. That's where I see what's new. That's where the edges still are. It's great, you know, whatever. Um, so for me, I think you do need to play in this. 
Um, I, it's funny, I've seen Columbia and Harvard and all now with their six month digital transformation courses. I hope that what they're doing is much more practical uh, stuff, getting people to actually test stuff, you know, getting three execs to build a mobile app with a no code development platform. That'd be fascinating, you know? So those things I think are important uh, on it. So I think that's part of what I mean when you get your hands dirty. Um, Cause I'm generally in double digit hyper growth companies. Um, my job is often to step into the hole until we decide to hire somebody dedicated to fill that. So, you know, I'm a quick learner. Um, I want to absorb, um, you know, a little bit of experience, hopefully some wisdom has come and I can mitigate some of the risk at times and whatever. So, you know, that's an area I look at. So if I've got a team of 10 doing demand generation, we're going to deploy, you know, some account-based marketing into the HubSpot. Let me figure all that out. You know, let me put the plan in place because I want you guys still delivering high quality MQLs. You know, that's a good example. You know, awesome. on the, you know, same in the product team, you know, we need to test a mobile app platform that myself and one of the coders go on the side, test, do an MVP, look at stuff, you know? Yeah, no, I think, I think what I love about that chain is it sort of says that by you being on the front lines, you know, by you being able to, to sort of understand both the voice and the actions of the customer, <laughs> it's, it's a, a demonstration and a commitment to your team that um, you're not above or beneath anything that you're, you're in the same team with them. And I love that just from a, a signaling perspective. And I think signaling is so important and I continue to learn about that. You talked a lot about uh, customer journey maps. One of the things I'd love to talk about, you know, I've actually had the pleasure of working with some of, of your mentor, you know, mentees rather, people you have mentored, excuse me, I always said it backwards. Um, when you think about just great mentors you've had or great mentees you've worked with, how do you go about creating career maps for them? I know that's something that you've thought about quite a bit. I'd love for you to unpack, like, how do you design a career map for somebody? Sure. I'm actually sitting in a webinar with my rugby club on Monday talking about the marketing PR. So a um, long, long time back in Ireland, I worked with the head of Cantrell and Cochrane, which was the big software. So think of, you know, not Pepsi Coke, but major. And I was at a point, I was sales and print. So any of you who sell print know that it's a tough industry. And I said, this is not me, uh, but, well, but you add value. So you find something in sales where it requires consultative and help the person along. And he sat me down and he just said, look, map out what you've done today. What are your hard soft skills? And it was on paper. Okay, now tell me where you want to go next. Forget titles, where you want to go next. And we took some titles too. And I started to see, okay, what might I have done different had I known better? wiser what do i need to learn in hard skills soft skills oh by the way i'm not a sales guy you know learn that quickly on so i actually took that and put it into a spreadsheet for somebody i worked with um, a young irish lady came over about 10 years ago who was in marketing and biz dev and you know i could see where her skill sets were kind of you know but she needed to figure it out so i have it now and it, it identifies hard and soft skills it's it's related mostly to marketing and product people also biz dev says folks and I just say look fill it out you know you don't need to show it to me I can now look at where are you lacking in skills or where do you need to improve and also you know sometimes your weaknesses so you know when I'm coaching a rugby team you know I'm picking you because of your strengths you know if you've one really bad weakness that just needs to be shored up sure we'll do that but I'm picking you because you can run 50 yards faster quicker better than anybody else or something like that. So it's also focusing on your strengths, building that out. Uh, also understanding, you know, are you at the point in your career where you need deeper depth or more generic, you know, as you move and you sometimes equate that to titles, director, to VP, to whatever. Um, so that's a map. And I say, look it out, you know, look out five years, uh, 10 years, and whatever. So it's sitting with people like that and um, sitting with founders. Funny enough, generally, you know, we get to that point where particularly where it's tech founders, Okay, who's going to split the business side? Who's going to split the tech side? Next step is, okay, you know what? I really like coding and developing and the architecture, but I don't like product. Mm. Yeah, okay. So particularly if you need to shift from being product-centric to start customer-centric as well. So like sitting there and say, okay, so which way do you want to go? Yeah, and well, what, I, what I always like to say, Shane, is um, all great engineers – are great developers, but not all great developers are great engineers. You know, for me, developers build software, engineers design products. Yes. Um, and for me, there's just a, there's a grave distinction between the two. And I think that um, it's not that you chase tech and you don't, don't solve problems for humans. We can see how that, that sort of bodes for different companies. 
I know we got about just a couple minutes left here. I want to make sure we, we get some we, we get to answer all the questions from the audience. So if you haven't asked your question yet, please feel free to pop that in the Q and A section. Um, Shane's got a lot of wisdom, and I'd love for you to ask any questions that um, would help you advance any of the challenges or pain points that you're facing. Um, so I actually, one, one thing I do want to it's it's been in a couple of places along the way. So you know where I am in my career today and. What I've seen out of COVID is, and it reflected to the remote. So it's just going to get really interesting. I think as leaders, and not all C-suite are leaders. So leaders are people who inspire, or hopefully, you know, drive behaviors. If we're going to have to spend less time actually in the functional side of things because we're going to have to invest more time building relationships because we're not face to face. So yeah. understanding the nuances and whatever. And I think that's going to be a huge challenge in organizations. So, you know, one of the things I do automatically, you know, we use the term if I get hit by a bus in the morning is I'm always looking at at least two successors behind me. And, you know, so simply if I get sick, they can step in in the executive meeting, fill in, they can drive stuff and stuff like that. I think that's going to be a massive challenge. I had seen it already when I talked to corporate people about 10 years ago. And they're like, these millennials, I don't know how to manage them. There's the problem. It's you, not them. And having successfully actually at the last four companies, almost 95% millennial teams, I love it. It's great. It's fun. Uh, maybe because they still act a little too young or whatever. But um, those are the challenges that I'm going to see as greatest uh, coming forward out of this. Um, you, know, and, you know, I see people like IBM. They look for their CEOs to spend 30% of their time with their staff. Um, it'd be interesting to change KPIs a little for people, you know. And that's Absolutely. No, I, what I love about all this transformation is, you know, for me, the one thing I take away for all, all the four for four folks listening now or in the future is, you know, you can't have any type of transformation if you don't embrace change and you can't embrace change if you're not willing to fail or make mistakes. So whether you're designing your career map or your customer journey map or whatever it is, you know, I think understanding where you're at and understanding where you're trying to get to takes a sense of vision, takes a sense of planning, and I think it's it's difficult for a lot of folks to get off the hamster wheel. You know, I see somebody message uh, the chat privately here, and they said, you know, I'm in a I'm in a mid level position in my company. How do I go about enacting transformation so I can have more have more participation and create more value? So, just from your perspective, Shane, having been in the middle and been at the top in your career. When you're at the top, how do you get someone who's in the middle to, to be able to, to speak up if they don't have someone like you that's in that C-suite? Yeah, that's a tough one. I actually mentoring somebody at the moment who's done a fabulous job in the podcast market. And we just caught up yesterday. And I'm like, wow, you're filling everything I thought you would. You're ready. You're ready to run the business. You're ready to be the VP of whatever, you know. And, um, you know, in, in their case, it'll be simply putting together a story and showcasing and um, what they've done and how they've added a whole different level to their growth of their podcast business, you know? And that's just simply enabling that person. I'm no longer, he no longer talks to me. You know, it's facilitating some of that. Um, you know, it's hard if you don't have somebody. Sometimes your mentor is maybe not on your team and that's a tough one. So if you're marketing, you're, hopefully your CMO is mentoring you. Maybe it's the head of revenue, maybe it's the product people. Um, hopefully your organization allows for some level of experimentation and you can find a project, you can back in your project or an idea or work with somebody else to showcase that skill, you know? Absolutely. No, for sure. Um, got a pretty interesting futuristic question, which I, you know, I can't turn those down, Shane. Um, one of the questions we got from the audience here really um, asked the question of, with the emergence of, of voice-based user interfaces, things like Siri, Alexa, and others, uh, moving more and more towards a whole new era of user interfaces. Um, a challenge that this person's facing right now is um, that there's not an organized screen of options. So how does a company create a customer journey map um, when the journey can be practically infinite and the tree of possibilities of how questions makes countless options? Um, I have a unique perspective on that, Shane, if you don't mind me sharing, I might just go ahead and sure. enter it, but I'd love for you to dive in because you've done a lot with voice as well. Yeah. Um, do you want me to just kick? I would just say, so just, just separate customer journey map at a high level, because I think those of us have really experienced it's at a UX level. We're solving a definitive problem to build an app or something like that, right? So when you get down to that level, um, absolutely. Um, I'm one of, one of people that 
I worked with that now I look up to several have said if you ever start a company we join you he is now Alexis prime partner he's driving these things he uses a, a journey map you know um, you know do what you just did whiteboard it okay so think about it if it was a phone conversation now you're looking for voice to do it start at some place and whiteboard it. big believer in whiteboards prefer it to PowerPoints you know um, I was an acer and voice because I don't like to speak publicly on phones and I hate when we're on planes and trains. But I, I absolutely bought into it, uh, particularly because I'm driving some telehealth stuff and using the same concept of telehealth in other markets, particularly ones that require assistance around the product and service and stuff like that. And we will want to do voice activated stuff in there. Um, start, start simple, you know, solve one problem. Do that, yeah. build it, you know. I love that. And just, just for the person that asked that question, one thing I would just add one step deeper on is what I would say is the idea of an interface is about creating a conversation that leads to an outcome or an end result. So the thing that I would offer up is, you know, before I, I nerd out and I can speak to you offline, if you want to shoot me a note on Twitter, I'm just at Pete Senna. Um, I know a lot about this stuff. I'm happy to just give you some tips as to what not to do because I made a million mistakes there. But you know, I'm not going to get into machine learning and AI and, and that in this conversation because we only have just a couple of minutes and I want Shane to, to plug some of the stuff that he's up to these days. But I, I do think just to, to simplify it, when designing for voice-based interfaces or any type of new gestural-based interface, whether it be voice or touch or whatever it is, um, what I always like to say is think about the conditional types of things that happen, right? So understand how you can provide a gratuitous user experience where even if the person asks a question, you know, I think about when we were doing some work with um, a leading footwear brand uh, in the Amazon Alexa store with a skill, we basically put some funny jokes in there. So if you asked a question that was off, we didn't have an answer, we sort of hooked you with entertainment. So sometimes you can use entertainment as a, as a way to do that. One of the things that I would also offer up is, is do improv. Um, do improv with a real human. So when you're designing those interfaces, you know, Amazon's done a really good job, Google's done a great job of releasing um, different templates you can use. Again, it's a little bit more in the weeds from a UX perspective. But I think what I'm seeing increasingly happen now with companies like the Twilio's, the Amazon's, the Google's, the Apple's of the world, is they're actually working with actors who are creating these types of scripts, so voice-based scripts. One of my favorite leaders in the company, um, if you've ever booked a meeting with me, I use x.ai. Um, Dennis Mortensen doing incredible things with natural language to be able to interpret and book meetings, solve a very specific problem. So I think that the key takeaway here is any type of transformation is trying to move us closer to the ability to connect as people, as humans. And I think what voice-based user interfaces are simply trying to do is add a different level of language to how we can create relationships and conversations with businesses and brands. So I hope that's helpful for, for the person that asked that question. Um, Shane, I know we've got about 30 seconds left. How does this audience stay in touch with Shane? You know, where we go, websites, Twitter, et cetera, to stay in touch with you and just follow the transformational work that you're doing with your customers and startups? Sure, uh, LinkedIn and probably Instagram. Um, I do post stuff to Twitter, but I never go on it, so I'll be honest about that. <laughs> um, I just I know it's part of to do as a person. Stuff. Awesome. Well, for everyone that tuned in today, I know we're just about out of time, so if I didn't get to your question, um, I do apologize, but you know, please feel free to tune into the next episode of 444. We're gonna be doing these bi-weekly, um, so twice a month. Um, and just wanna say thanks so much for tuning in. And Shane, thanks so much for joining. Um, until the next time. Yes, looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much.